I can extremely summarize the introduction of the presentation because I was going to give a very extensive description of all our presenters' amazing work um, here beyond. So I'll just do it briefly. Um, my name is Karina Loyan. I'm a director of the Center for Latinx Studies in the Americas and I'm honored to be a co-sponsor of this event together with the Thatcher Gallery. I want to thank Maurice Simmons for all her amazing work throughout the years at Thatcher and for leading um, this amazing show. And to obviously to the curators as well, Rio Yanez and Angelica Rodriguez for the amazing work. Gallery and the University of San Francisco sit on the ancient land of the Ramatush speaking people of the Jelamu tribe. One of approximately 50 independent nations now referred to as Ohlone. The Ohlone people are still here working for the right to terrain, to remain and evolve in the place we consider San Francisco. Uh, we recognize the rich culture heritage that has survived. Um, colonization, genocide, and honor Ohlone artists, past, present, and future. So um, I'm going to move on to a brief presentation of our speakers. Uh, first, curator and artist, Rio Yanez. Um, <laughs> very excited to also introduce Jessica Savogal, a Colombian American muralist, printmaker, if you walk around the streets of San Francisco, you'll see uh, Jessica's work, uh, especially when I think on Folsom Street of Yolanda as well. And last but not least, Carrie Cordula, welcome all the way from Texas. She, she came here for this particular event, a scholar that we all follow for all her tremendous work on the history of San Francisco art and activism, so welcome as well. And again, this is, this is your presentation, so I'm moving really on. So welcome, thank you. Welcome everyone, uh, my name is Rio Yanez and I'm just going to say a few words about the show before we uh, get to our featured guests. So, um, my mother Yolanda Lopez passed away in 2021 and kind of at, starting at that point was a two year journey to assemble this show and really all of the works that you see in the show came out of her small one-bedroom apartment in the Mission District uh, and the basement that uh, resided underneath her apartment building. And she was so resilient with the work that she did and caretaking for her work. Um, and it's been a really kind of unique and magical process to assemble this show with my co-curator and Helica Rodriguez. And Helica, I know you're, you're just like trying to like sneak in, but wave to everyone and say hi. Um, it's very rare for uh, a child to curate the work of their parents, and um, I feel very, very blessed and very honored to be able to um, give my mom something that she's really, really wanted, which is just eyes on her work. Um, that um, has been one of the lifelong struggles, and most of the work uh, that you've seen here at, in, in, at the Thatcher Gallery has either not been seen in the last 40 or 50 years, or only been exhibited uh, once or twice. So this is really an opportunity to share with everyone um, work and labor uh, that my mom has done. And uh, the reason why it's called Women's Work is Never Done, um, it takes its name from the Silk Screen series she did in the 90s, but it was really to kind of talk about the idea of invisible labor. Um, my mom made her work kind of documenting and honoring the women in her family, but also the, the work that they did. Uh, her mother was a seamstress for the Navy, who spent decades sewing uh, uniforms for the Navy. Uh, her grandmother, who there, there, you've seen portraits of there, uh, worked in the laundry room of a hotel, and she 
washed sheets and towels for a living. And that was their invisible labor, and that, that was how they were able to provide for my mom. And my mom herself, um, the work that she created was not done in a vacuum. Uh, she was a full-time mother, uh, had to pay rent and bills in San Francisco, and it meant that in addition to the income that her artwork and art career brought in, uh, she sold Mary Kay, she um, worked at the gift wrap counter at Macy's during the holiday season. Um, when she was younger, she was a live-in nanny. So there's all sorts of work um, that isn't really seen or appreciated, um, and that's really what allowed her to produce the work uh, that she is so well known for. And so I just, uh, Angelica and I, in assembling this exhibit, really wanted to honor her labor, both as an artist, but also acknowledge all of the work that she did in order to be able to actually sit in front of a canvas, sit in front of a piece of paper, and create the work that you see on the walls. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to our first guest, Jess Sabogal. Come on up. Oh man, I just want to sit and uh, listen to Rio all night. first-generation Colombian-American muralist and printmaker. Um, I'm a firm believer that in life, um, you only get a few soulmates, and Yolanda was definitely one of them for me. Um, she embodied so many different people for me. Um, all at the same time, she was my mother, my grandmother, my biggest fan, my friend, my mentor, um, and also because of the beauty of the cycle of life, towards the end, I became one of her caretakers, and so she also became my child. Um, Yolanda's passing has profoundly impacted how I think about time, you know, so I think um, there was the before times when Yolanda was alive, and we were friends and family, and now we're, of course, in the after, in the aftermath of that. So that's kind of how I'm going to structure the next 15 minutes. Um, my relationship to Yolanda before, uh, when she was still alive, and then, um, after, after she has passed. Um, so this is a picture of the first day that I uh, oh, Yo, oh, I'm not even on. I'm not even on. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, great, wonderful. Thank you for letting me know. Thank you so much. Um, this is a photo of Yolanda and I on the day we met. Um, and I just think it's so sweet. I'm like 12 years old in this photo. But um, <laughs> I just think it's so sweet because like you're rarely able to pinpoint the moment that a relationship begins, let alone have it photographed. And so what's happening here is um, Ani Rivera, the executive director of Galleria, had the foresight to bring us together um, to complete Galleria's historic uh, billboard. So there we are on site trying to assess like the dimensions and what needs to be done. Um, and one thing I really remember about this day is I hadn't, this was the second thing I'd ever worked on in my life. I hadn't done anything and Yolanda really treated me as her equal. She never looked down down at me or talked in, in a condescending way towards me. Um, and this is uh, the unveiling where we worked with um, local youth from Karesin, um for 10 weeks, Yolanda and I, and um, yeah, we had an unveiling ceremony and at the unveiling cer ceremony, Yolanda made a speech. And in the speech, she tells me that the work that we did together was important and basically to keep going and do my thing, you know? and. As somebody um, that grew up without an art degree, I didn't go to art school, and you know, I had two parents telling me to do anything but art. Um, <laughs> having an elder in the community tell me like to keep doing my thing was really important for me. Um, so as our relationship grew, she would often invite me to her apartment where she shared with me her ideas and showed me how her work developed over time. And this was only a few weeks before she passed. Um, she had a bunch of us over, and still she was so generous with her time and her knowledge and stories about her work. 
Um, here she is showing us the original like black and white portraits. Um, that would be the reference photos for her famous uh, Guadalupe paintings. And this is a photo that I took. She might murder me if she knew I was sharing this photo, but this is a photo that I took inside of her apartment um, where she had stored the Guadalupe's and many of her pieces, as Rios describing, uh, for a long time. And so she calls me up one night and she's like, Jess, like, I'm freaked the fuck out. I don't know about their condition. Um, can you come over and can you let's like do the damn thing and like let's unravel them and just see like where we're at. Um, and so, of course, we unraveled them, and um, luckily they were in perfect condition. You know, they were pristine, no like watermarks or folding or anything. Um, and here she is, just showing me um, every detail of like her grandmother's portrait. And so, um, I was a little bit blacked out because I had, you know, these are her masterpieces. So I um, had only ever read about them or seen them online, you know, and they were just here. Uh, we were all together. Um, so I was feeling that, and then on the other hand, I was feeling like, like my heart was aching a little bit because, um, you know, she, she shouldn't have to be the one to to worry about them. You know, she shouldn't have to be about uh, to worry about their condition and make sure that they were okay. You know, like here we were in her in her bedroom, and um, you know, we weren't in some key card entry like high level security, um, like uh, what's it called, uh, like an archive uh, where they should be. So this is a photo of the early exhibition, early stages of the exhibition planning uh, for Yolanda's solo show, uh, which is, is currently on view in San Jose. So that show's gonna close very soon. I highly recommend that you all go. Um, Jill, the curator, came up to package the work, and so we all went down to Yolanda's basement to unpack what had been there for the last you know, 40, 50 years. Um, and as you can see, we're doing our best to care for the works, um, but all we had was her basement floor. And I just love, like, Yolanda's Face. She's just like so pumped that everything's like being unraveled finally, you know. Um, so I love this photo because of that. Um, so I say all this to y'all because to know uh, Yolanda and her work so well, I always felt this deep sense of like profound injustice. She was so smart and so ahead of her time that I felt like she was punished for it, you know, as women who often step out of line do. Um, over the course of her career, it was so clear how the patriarchy and racism were at play within art institutions and academia um, that she was never really able to treat, uh, reap the benefits of her work. I feel that institutions failed her. They didn't choose to value her yet, to acquire her yet, to preserve her work yet, or even to let her teach. Um, it hurt my heart and it still hurts my heart. So to push back against this reality, um, I have put her in my artwork all throughout my career. I felt like if institutions were not going to uplift her, then the very small power that I had to put her in my artwork, I, I could do that. And so um, when I was forwarded the request for proposals for the new affordable housing complex that was being built in the mission, um, here you see the mock-ups of uh, what was delivered to all the artists. Like, you too can have your artwork here. I felt it like in my bones and in my blood that this would be how um, I would like erect a monument of Yolanda. You know, I hadn't, I still had to apply and like get through all the interviews and everything, but it's like when you know, you know, you know. Um, so this is a video of the final piece. And that's me and my partner working on the fourth wall there for scale. process to the actual painting um, took about a year and a half. So this mural was not meant to only erect a monument of Yolanda, but um, also to have a place to remember all the stories that she left to me. I'm not going to get too in depth about all the movements, but I hope you'll jot them down, jot them down later um, to, to research at a later time. 
You can see two of my crew members touching up the basta ya here, which I included as a nod to Los Siete de la Raza and all the social programs that came out of that time. Yolanda, of course, the sole illustrator for the newspaper. We ask to this day, what does solidarity look like? Um, and Yolanda was always telling me about how the Panthers extended their solidarity to Los Siete. Um, the Panthers, of course, had their own prolific newspaper. You know, they were, had 150,000 readers and you know, they gave Los Siete free ad space to um, advocate on behalf of uh, the Basaya movement. And then of course the Basaya movement was birthed as a result of this, you know. And these are all little bits of like oral information that I had no idea about. And Yolanda would just be like at Costco and she would be like, oh, by the way, um, <laughs> this is a, you know, this this happened. Um, the Panthers also let Los Siete use their, loyal, uh, their lawyer for the, char for the trial at no charge. Uh, Yolanda also taught me about the indigenous um, occupation of Alcatraz in 1969, which, you know, I grew up in San Francisco and I had never heard a thing about it, which is, is, is shocking to me, you know. Um, and then, of course, uh, so this piece on the right is actually in the show, and when I first saw it, I mean, it's kind of like seeing, like, like the Constitution or something for me. It's kind of like, I can't believe this is like a physical object that is just right there that you all can go see, so definitely check this piece out in the show. Um, but here she, you know, she shortened the Virgen's cloak and gave her feet with which to walk, and that, of course, is a symbol and will always be a symbol for um, women's empowerment and liberation. So I took the graffiti from Alcatraz and Yolanda's Virgen and added my own twist to it um, by adding mola prints in her garment. Um, where, and mola prints are like indigenous patterns um, from Colombia, where my family's from. I also added it in the backwards American flag behind her um, as a symbol of indigenous resistance. And I'll just quickly end this chapter with saying um, that this is the hardest thing that I've ever worked on, and not because of the scale, but because there was pushback at every phase um, during the part where I was like proposing mock-ups and things. You know, I think it's important to talk about like what it takes to get to uh, to finish an artwork like this. And you know, it, it wasn't all like fun and games. Like it was actually very difficult. I got a lot of gray hairs and lost a lot of sleep. Um, because I had to advocate uh, for putting Yolanda up on such a big scale. Um, the organizers of the, of the building did not want to put like a single woman of color up there. They were like, why don't we just like, what about like a group of women or like an organization? Um, and I just feel like, the, you know, we're, we don't have problems with like our huge Cesar Chavez murals or our big Malcolm X murals. It's like, you know, so I feel like specifically for women of color, um, it's like a risk uh, to be able to put them up on such a large scale. Um, but in the end, I just remember saying to myself, like, history will absolve me. That's what I kept saying on in my mind. And, um, you know, of course, after the fact, the day she passed, we were able to gather there. And I just feel like people now are like, oh, like, I get it. I get why this was done. Um, and so, um, in talking about time, uh, this photo marks the after. This is the day that she passed, September 3rd, um, 2021. And the photographer, Jean, I just feel like just it just captures the mood of that day so well. Um, we do look sad, but I also feel like there's like so much power in this photo. Um, Yolanda left us all with a responsibility to make a ruckus. And if you just look at everybody in this photo, like everybody is out there in their own way, like doing that. You know, and, and we're just like a small percentage of the crew. I feel like there's like so many of us that are out here doing our thing. Um, so this is a photo uh, that my partner Sean and I we had a solo show in DC about three months ago, and it felt really important to have Yolanda there, um, kind of as a guardian and looking over um, the 20 pieces that we had completed over the last six years. Um, building altares has not typically been a part of my art practice, um, but ever since she passed, I have built a number of them specifically for her. Um, as a way to just like be close and be able to like maintain my relationship with her. After she passed, um, I just felt like there was no way that I'll never get to talk to her again. So I just keep talking to her. <laughs> um, I give her snacks if I'm eating something that I think she'll like. Um, I'll like put it up for her. Um, and just through listening and even in my dreams, um, I feel like she continues to, to teach me things and tells me to participate in things, you know, like she told me to be here today. Um, so in the show, I debuted my newest piece a triptych entitled Adonde Llegaste Chicanex 1, 2, and 3, 
which are 16 color screen prints on paper with gold leaf. I took the photographs Yolanda took in 1979 of the Santas Lucas, an all-female car club in San Francisco, this is also in the show, um, and brought them into the current day with my style. The title is a nod to Yolanda's runner series, Adonde Vas Chicana, you can see those in San Jose, um, where y Yolanda was almost at the beginning of career, her career. And now this title is me kind of looking back on her life. Adonde llegaste, where did you get to, where did you go? Um, I hand cut each layer of their shadows out of a film called Ruby Lift, and the photographs um, around her, around them are taken from either my phone, my own family archive or um, Rio, I'm so grateful to you for allowing me access to your mother's archive. Um, and this turned into an eight, eight month ritual and conversation where I was asking Yolanda ultimately if she felt fulfilled by her life, um, if she felt proud of what she had accomplished, did she get to do the things that she had hoped for? And we all kind of know the answer to that, but I felt like I needed a place to be able to process that. And then the longer I worked on it, um, it just turned into a lar larger conversation. Like with the Santas that she photographed in 1979, you know, they too are now in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. Like they also were constrained by like the patriarchy, motherhood, women's work, and capitalism. Did they get to live the lives that they wanted? You know, um, my mom is in here. Like, has my mom gotten to live the life she wanted? And ultimately, like, will I? You know, under all these constraints. Um, and so. In the top left photo is a photo of me um, at Yolanda's Memorial Ruckus. Uh, Jackie and Katinka had put together like a backdrop where you could like take a photo with her Guadalupe rays. And so this particular photo is like really important to me. One, because my dad took it, but two, because it just kind of marks this new chapter of like our relationship. Um, and here I'm thinking about Yolanda's Yilar artist friends um, in their center there, like her little homies, those little youngsters. So there's uh, like Lorraine, uh, her sister that passed Eva, there's Celia in there, and then there's like a young, a young Yolanda. Um, in the bottom left is like a very young Yolanda with Rio, like baby Rio. On the bottom right is just like a super mod, but, like beautiful, like, I don't know, she's maybe like 20 something um, Yolanda. And then juxtaposed with um, um, the Guadalupe drawing and uh, the runner series in the background. And then my mom's on the top right there. Um, so again, I've never done this before. I've never collaborated with somebody that has passed on. But um, I felt like it was just the time to uh, listen, like really listen and like trust my intuition with the work. You know, I'm kind of asking like, is this OK? Like, this isn't my words. These aren't my photographs. Like, I'm deep in Yolanda's little love notes. You know, I'm sure you feel the same way, you know, um, but we just, you know, went for it. Um, and this is the last slide that I'll show. Um, but at Yolanda's Memorial Ruckus, um, Professor Celia Herrera Rodriguez referenced the Aztec goddesses Siwa Tadeo in her speech about Yolanda. And I didn't quite understand what she meant by it, so I did jot down the name um, to research at a later time. And so for those of you that, that don't know, the Siwa Tadeo are the spirits of the women that died in childbirth. And so, as I printed each layer, I came to understand that Yolanda too now resides among the Siwatateo. The only reason that Chicanx and Latinx art has a place in the mainstream art world today, the reason my work has been accepted and acquired, is because Yolanda and so many of the women artists of her generation, quote, died in childbirth. Because their careers could not fully be realized, um, ours have the opportunity to do so. And it's just, it's so profound to me, you know, it's, it's the reason I'm up here today, it's the reason, like, Angelica was able to curate this whole exhibition, you know, um, it's the reason, you know, like, uh, I think Katika's here, like, you're the dean of the, the whole department, let alone there's, like, a department to begin with, you know what I mean? Um, and it's, it's your published book, Carrie, you know, it's, um, we all, um, she's been able to train all of us to succeed in this life, um, and for that I'm so grateful, and so because of that I placed, like, little see what that deals in all of the paintings, so. Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's me so far. Uh, thank you very much. All right, it is now my pleasure to introduce Carrie Cordova. Thank you, Rio. <laughs> First, I, I just want to 
acknowledge that jazz, that it, it's such beautiful work, and it's just, it's amazing. It's amazing to see it. Uh, <laughs> yeah.
thinking about Yolanda as an artist and an activist, even just those terms have always felt really limiting in terms of the kinds of worlds that she encompassed. She worked in multiple genres, right? And so I'd like to list, she worked as a painter, a filmmaker, a printmaker, a photographer, an installation artist. She created tiny art. She created flower art. She created triptychs. She created drawings, photographs, posters, conceptual art and every possible kind of genre bending that she could imagine. She interviewed people, she mentored people, she collected everything. And you just don't get that impression necessarily. And so I, that's one of the virtues of walking an exhibit like that and seeing some of the ways in which her work intersected with her activism with a multiplicity of social movements, including the Chicano movement, the Third World Liberation Movement, the feminist movement, and the ever-present, does it ever go away, anti-war movement. Right? Throughout her life, she sought to dismantle normative categories, to spur dialogues on a wide array of issues, including education, immigration, feminism, and the economy. She never allowed herself to be defined by a single medium nor a single audience. And I find that's exactly what made her such an incredible artist and provocateur. So um, I first came to her because I was trying to understand the events of 1968, the Third World Strike at San Francisco State in particular, and knowing she had been there. And I uh, ended up doing an oral history with her that lasted for a few days. and that. You know, I encourage everyone to do oral history because it is sometimes the best education you can ever get. And I say that as a professor. Right? Like, you know, I cannot teach the things that you can learn through oral history. So as part of the international student movement of 1968, that third world strike was formative in leading universities across the nation to recognize and incorporate ethnic studies into their curriculums. As Jess said, she is you know, here because of that work. And I want to point out the ways in which it's not simply through Yolanda's art, but it's through her activism that I can even be speaking here today. Because she created ethnic studies, she and others of her generation that did that kind of work that then facilitated the, the possibilities for those of us here today. And maybe that's also a point of optimism, right, to think in a world in which I think we have a lot of struggles, uh, that we can make a difference for our future generations. So Yolanda was born in 1942, and I'll point out that that's the same year that my mother was born, and therefore she kind of occupied this very maternal role for me, and you know, like, I. I, is it okay? We're, we're close, uh, just yeah. a little bit of sibling sort of sensibility we there, you know. <laughs> and um, you know, and I just uh, felt just a an enormous sense of in, intellectual connection to this woman who never stopped thinking, never stopped asking questions, and it's remarkable just in terms of thinking of her background and the ways in which she grew up with a single mother who was working as as Rio has already said like you know um, as a laundry presser or a seamstress and and sort of working these very different low-key jobs but I think her mother also always uh, expressed the importance of political engagement right and so I do see that coming from her growing up experience when Yolanda moved to Northern California in the early 1960s to live with her uncle and attend college, first at San Francisco State and then the College of Marin. She joined SNCC, or the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which some of us have studied. And upon graduating from College of Marin, she returned to San Francisco State to take art classes, and that's where she found herself in the midst of this kind of student revolution, right? So her experiences in the Chicano and Third World Liberation movements as an activist working alongside the Black Panthers in the trial of Los Siete de la Raza, as an exhibiting artist and documentarian at Galleria de la Raza, as a featured artist in almost every survey of Chicano and women's art, and as an anti-war activist then 
are only a few of the ways in which her life's work intersected with shifts in the larger culture. So I, I wanted to offer this kind of sort of historical context as I'm walking into this precious exhibit. And I'm starting with a work that is actually not by Yolanda, but it was so striking to me as I stood there and staring at the, you know, the, uh, <laughs> the professionally pressed, we can do it shopping bag. And um, seeing the, not just the, the we can do it, but the writing below it that made such an impact on me as I saw signed by Batita, women's work is never done, right? So you can see the women's work is never done, Batita in little red sharpie, right? And to think that there is Batita, who uh, is the author of multiple books, including 500 years of Chicano women's history, and who had been doing a lot of sort of similar things, but of an earlier generation than Yolanda. Um, she was born maybe t uh, almost 20 years older than Yolanda. Uh, but the, these two women had a lot in common, including passing away just a couple of months apart, right? And so thinking about the ways in which both of these women uh, work not just for the visibility of Chicano women in history and art history, but to raise consciousness about how tropes of womanhood, race, gender, sexuality, and access limited our capacity to see and understand the world. These women created a space for Chicanas to be intellectuals. Right? I mean, that's, you know, that's, that was a huge leap in terms of the possibilities and access. So the placement of this shopping bag at the start of the exhibit presents us with a seriously funny representation of their communal, never done radical work, while also offering a powerful way to embrace the memory of both women. Like Batita, like Rio and Angelica, like Moira Roth, I too in my writing have played with the phrase, women's work is never done, to give title to Yolanda's fortitude, her fierceness, and her commitment. The phrase supposedly draws on a historic couplet that I will repeat for you. Man may work from sun to sun, but woman's work is never done. Yolanda skewered that term, right? She visually challenged the way it illuminated sexism, but then also seemed to affirm gender domestic labor. She placed the phrase next to images of women activists and community leaders. Notably, she modified the phrase from the singular woman, ending in A-N, to the plural women, ending in E-N. So transforming the phrase from individual struggle to cross-racial solidarity and worldly engagement. I think Yolanda would get a kick out of knowing that if you Google the phrase, women's work is never done, she's the first link. <laughs> so, part of the beauty of this exhibit is appreciating how Rio and Angelica have provided source material for this creative work. Um, here is an example of her homage to Dolores Huerta. And they placed Yolanda's uh, well-kept front page of the San Francisco Examiner from October 30th, 1994 nearby so that you can see her use of that photograph. So while readers of this work have noted its advocacy for farm workers, I think it's less common to recognize the ways in which this work was also about Prop 187, right, from the front page. Um, the art not only paid homage to Huerta, but also less obviously critiqued the moment of xenophobia and nationalism. Yolanda said this, so I'd like to quote her. I was really interested in Dolores doing the intellectual work of organizing. So I have her in the background, and it's from an old photograph that I found on the first book written about the UFW published in 1965. But she's not mentioned in the book. <laughs> she's a cover girl. And she's standing there holding the sign that says, Si se puede. And it's just a wonderful photograph. So, I mean, that is Yolanda doing that work, right? Saying she's not just a cover girl. She actually is like a remarkable figure that is happening here for us to learn and know more. 
I heard Dolores Huerta speak in Austin about a month ago, which was really remarkable. And I would say that Yolanda and Dolores have shared a consistent, long-abiding belief in the importance and power of voting. And I have to say, Jess and I both saw this list and we said, that is so Yolanda. <laughs> that is like the, the list that I would see from her. And I love that prioritizing of vote at the very top of her to-do list, right? And the ways in which it sort of communicates this, you know, obviously more professional sort of representation of her work and your vote has power. So, um, the dynamic voice that shaped Yolanda's art was indicative of her personality. If she was unhappy with a situation, she let people know. <laughs> and not to be belligerent, but to demand better. As I was viewing this show, I felt her voice and thought about whether there was a way for me to share the way she called for all of us to do better. And forgive me, Rio, but I thought of the time that she organized a strike against our beloved community institution, Galleria de la Raza, which I know for Rio represented a tricky situation, as his mother was protesting the lack of women on view in the exhibition where his father had been invited to share his art. <laughs> so the show was meant to offer a tribute to earlier generations of artists but its erasure and marginalization of women did not sit well with Yolanda, Sherry Moraga, who was there, Juan Alicia, Judy Drummond, Joss Sensas, or Juan Fuentes. They made a big sign and they said, where are the women artists? And initiated a protest outside the reception in front of the billboard for the show. So here you can see the billboard for the show and the featured male figure for the Chicano artist and um, <laughs> I'd like to offer just, I'm hopeful that you can hear her. I'm, I'm, I'm getting close to closing here, but I'd like to offer you a minute's voice from Yolanda as she was speaking at this protest. And um, let's give it a shot and see if it works. Also, during the 60s and 70s, Chicano Latino artists were working in political organizations, community groups, the anti-war movement, the farm workers, supported the Cuban Revolution, and some were aligned with the Black Panthers and other movement groups in the struggle for civil rights. We were also participants in the counter-cultural revolution in the 1960s. San Francisco and Northern California were a potent environment for creativity and thought, and our art reflected our intimate involvement Too. And I just have one more image for you. 
And that is the last time that I was here at USF. I just wanted to include it because I gave a presentation talking about Yolanda's work. I spent a lot of time preparing for that. And nobody wanted to talk to me. They all wanted to talk to Yolanda. And there she was holding court, and exactly as it should be, frankly, because she was such an amazing person, mentor, figure, and I think, you know, I'm very grateful to Rio, to Angelica, to all of us for being a part of her legacies. So, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Should we, do we have enough time for some questions and answers? I, I think if people, there's no class trying to come in there, right? Okay, I yeah. think, sure, let's go for 15 more minutes. Okay. And I understand that some of you might have to go, so it's because they have classes, it's not. You know, it's yeah. Yeah. Um, so, thank you all to the folks that are having to head out. I appreciate you being here so much. I want to recognize something um, in Jess's presentation, the, um, the use of the Virgin Guadalupe image where she shows her legs and is wearing heels. It was such a vindication uh, for my mom, but also for, for me as well as her son, uh, to see that work celebrated at such a large scale. Um, because in the 80s when it was published, I remember being in the kitchen with my mom and the phone ringing and her picking up the phone and someone threatened to kill her because of that piece, that specific artwork uh, and the fact that it was being published uh, on the cover of a magazine. And um, my mom really had to, to advocate and stand up for her work uh, over the years and you know, she was threatened with a lot of harm for the images that she created. And it just, um, it feels like we've come a long way uh, in a really beautiful way now to see that work celebrated and to um, hear her being recognized and, and see that imagery being recognized. Um, so uh, I just, um, it just, it really hit me seeing it there and it really brought me back to being five years old standing next to my mom when she got that call for that piece. Um, so thank you, Jess, for, for being a part of that. Um, so let's uh, open it up. Do we have any questions for our panelists? Anything? Any questions? Yeah, Boo. Uh, Jerry, could you tell me, I didn't catch it, but it's the year that oh, the, 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 the protest? The protest, yeah. 1994. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Part of it was the striking. Uh, how could this be happening in 1994? <laughs> Where did you find the video? How do we get That's access to this fun. video? Yeah. Shereen Moraga's like a little, little. Oh, oh my gosh! Youngster I, 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 yes, I, I, yeah. So Sheree speaks. It's uh, Juan Alicia speaks. Oh it's actually very um, sweet because it actually starts where they're doing the poster, they're creating the poster, mm -hmm. and Yolanda is giving instructions uh -huh. on like how they are going to lead the march, and so she's like, so we're gonna go here, and then we're gonna turn it, and then you know, and then they get there, and then they're like, wait, no, this isn't working, and they have to kind of cross the street, and it's 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 very sweet. So, so it is uh, part of the uh, UCSB uh, SEMA archive, so you can find it. Yeah. When I was 12 years old, I was, so, you know, those, those, all the folks there were of a generation where they weren't big computer users at the time, as it was the early 90s. So I was the only one with a computer with Microsoft Word. So my mom dictated the press release for the ad hoc committee protesting, uh, and I actually wrote the press release on <laughs> Microsoft Word at 12 years old uh, for that action. That really uh, makes it even more wonderful because they read that press release <laughs> at the site. So, yeah. All right. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes.
Well, I, I think um, <laughs> I would say that was one of the biggest um, one of the biggest challenges since she passed away in talking about her life and her work is what to share. Um, uh, a couple days ago, Carrie came to visit uh, my mom. We, we've held on to my mom's apartment as the, the base of operations to archive and catalog her artwork, and it was very convenient because that's where it was all stored. Um, and I think one of the most challenging parts of being her son and being the keeper of so much information about her life and work is what to share. and and. You know, wanting to paint a complete picture as possible and have everyone be informed as possible, but to also kind of respect her privacy, and um, it's it's harder than I ever would have imagined. And so when Carrie was standing in the room, I, I told her a story that uh, after uh, my mom passed away, uh, my partner Sada and I found boxes and boxes of Home Shopping Network jewelry, and it turns out my mom was addicted to the Home Shopping Network for several years, and yeah. we just didn't know. Um, and it, she would be mortified with me, <laughs> but um, I and, and to that point, it, it's been um, it, it's one of the hardest struggles for me as her son, and and kind of acknowledging her place in in the world and how important. Her work and her voice has been is um, that balance of um, what to share and how to share it. All right. Any other questions? Yeah. yeah I, I was really interested in this idea of. Um, I think just just that you mentioned um, regarding what she wasn't able, like the the boundaries. Uh, the barriers, because she's always existed in my mind as so, you know, such a major figure that I don't know why I hadn't thought about like what she wasn't able to accomplish or what those boundaries were for her, and so that's just something I'm interested in. I don't know, hearing more about like what were there certain things that she wanted to achieve that she was held back from in some way. Yeah, I, I just, I, in knowing her as a friend, I will say, you know, she'd be like, I really want to go to the dentist, and I really want a tailored suit, and I really want, um, you know, she was very much working class, and so, you know, a lot of artists of her generations do have houses, do have tenure track um, positions at universities, they do have, like, fancy archives where everything is in flat files and, like, beautifully rolled, and... Um, yeah, it was like it's it, it, it again. It's like it hurts. It hurts my heart that that uh, it's like how like how did this happen? Um, um, I I won't. Of course, Yolanda's like super grand in our minds, and like all, all these things like did happen. And she was in a lot of shows, but at the end of the day, it's like she was like a lot of us are able to stand on her shoulders. Now they're like, now things are happening. Now there's the Cheech. Now there's like all these things happening um, that didn't quite exist. You know, she would say to me, I'd ask her like, what's up with the Guadalupe? Do you want to sell those? Like, what's up, you know? And um, she was like, just no one wants them. Nobody wants them, right? And it's preposterous to hear that now, but it's like, that's how she felt about them. She, like, nobody wanted them, you know? And, and of course, that's all, all, also to think about like artists before and after they die. Once they die, boom, everything shoots up. We get murals of them everywhere. Um, you know, the <laughs> t-shirts, all the things, and we want all their artwork, and so that's like a larger conversation, but um, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think, uh, I, I, I almost wrote exactly the same thing in preparing for this, like arts institutions failed Yolanda widely, uh, vastly. And, um, I, you know, it's only as we, like I've, I've told Rio, you've become her agent. You did not mean to be, uh, but you have, you know, filled that role because the arts institutions have not stepped up and done that kind of work, which they should have been doing all along. And um, I, I think that that 
that is the loss. That is the sense of the constant sort of the ways in which a public intellectual, a creative genius, really, and but maybe not her own agent, right? Like people need other support too, and the ways in which she mentored so many of us in the community, but then at the same time we were not able to find those places in those institutions that would give her the ability to afford her dentist or you know and she also had a lot of um, health issues too that really made her career quite difficult so I'll just add that as well. Yeah I think um, in 2007 the Chicano Studies program at UCLA invited her out to speak and uh, lecture in several classes and while she was there, she um, uh, dropped into the chair of the art, the art school um, there and offered to speak to any classes, um, you know, it, it have them invite their students out to her talk, and they politely declined her. And she was just not taken seriously as an artist, you know, the, the art department at UCLA did not want her. It was the Chicago Studies program that brought her out there. And I think for me as her son, that really brought it into stark contrast. And it was definitely a revelation of kind of where she was at, in, in, at that moment and how she was perceived. I just wanted to add something talking about, you know, her, her, the way her work. We, we, we saw the three photos of the, of the hip, but I was just talking with you this evening. Uh, that poster she did of Who's the Alien Pilgrim, mm -hmm. that is all over. I see it on walls. I, I was just in San Diego and I went to an exhibit and they were exhibiting magazines and newspapers that were published uh, about the, you know, that, that period of Chicano art, and there it is. There it is in two publications right there. I was with your dad in Los Angeles. We were in, we were in uh, uh, Japantown, and there it was. It was up, up on the wall. It's just incredible, the, the amount of, I, 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 I've had people, I didn't see, but I've had people tell me they've seen it in New York. I mean, that, that image is just all over the place. It's just, it's Raging against the machine cover, apparently. What's that? Right oh. against the machine, apparently. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Um, I can tell you that, you know, she, once she got a sense of how far and wide that image was spreading, um, there's a great detail of the, that original that's in the gallery right now. If you look, you can see pasted up along the bottom is her home address. Um, this was before websites, before email addresses. So the only, she really wanted people to know that it was her work and where to find her and the only way she could do that was to include her home address um, into the poster print itself and you see it there on the original. Yeah. Is there a space where these collections may end up at or is there, what is the future for these pieces of work? You know, um, that's an ongoing project where we're, we're hoping to find long-term homes both for her archive and for her artwork. Um, I think now that, you know, this show and, and this, the, the exhibit in San Jose is kind of up and running, it's um, kind of entering into a next phase of kind of thinking a little bit more long-term with her body of work. But um, we're, we're working on it, but no, no specific news to really report on it. If you know of anything. <laughs> yeah. I just had a silly question. Did she keep running in San Francisco? On the uh, exhibit in San Diego, I loved her the paintings of running. I found them very special. I was wondering if she did how long she did that. She didn't run all that much once she moved back to the Bay Area. Um, motherhood, I think, just really changed her, her life and her bandwidth uh, and uh, just kind of the free time that she had. Um, but there was a time, uh, I would say in the 90s, where she had a friend and they would go running uh, together. Um, but I, I think what was really unique about 
her writing at that time period was like that was kind of her her form of really like working out a, a lot of the struggles she was having. Uh, she was feeling very isolated uh, at UC San Diego and. Um, like and her work really was being dismissed and, and not really uh, taken seriously by the professors there. So running was really her outlet. Uh, and you know now we have words like self care and therapy, but back then like she just ran. And so running for her really symbolized um, how she took care of herself both mentally and physically. I'll, I'll just add just because you reminded me like that the. The, the Guadalupe's were part of her, uh, her, her graduate work, right? Mm -hmm. And just to give you a sense, like she had a committee that didn't get it and didn't necessarily think that this deserved accreditation. And I mean, it's remarkable to think about the, the role that those works now play for us in this world versus the kind of opposition that she experienced at that time. Right, so then she had to go find someone at the medical school that was Latino to come and be on her uh, to committee. To explain right? it to her committee, yeah. exactly. All right, any other questions? I just wanted to thank you, Karen, for, for bringing up Petita. I, I met Yolanda through Petita, and when you said you know, all of the different things that Yolanda was involved in, um, I got to know Vegeta through uh, anti-war work uh, leading up to the second Iraq war. And, um, and then Yolanda started coming to these, to, to protest with, with her umbrella. Yeah. Uh, just sort of those, yeah, those connections. Um, it's super important. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Yeah. I, I... There's something so meaningful about thinking about those two women together and just seeing that particular piece, which is like iconic of that connection that they had. Yeah, and that, that resonated with me in a lot of different ways. Uh, and Helica, I actually want to throw to you really quick because you found that bag and you, you brought it to my attention. <laughs> Another Batita? No. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. We appreciate you coming out tonight. And uh, my thanks to Perry for the